Welcome to part four of this video series. We have been looking at ways that you could extract information from a set of fitness testing data to produce reports simply by selecting a name from a drop down box. In video number 85, we used the helper column that you can see in column D here to help us extract information. If you look at the formula inside column D, it's really just a combination of two existing fields or columns. So one athlete name, the second one test label. For this lesson, I have edited the test label. I have given it a much more descriptive name, pre-season 2016 week one. This is on the assumption that you may have data spread across many years and therefore having a descriptive label is much more useful than what we used in video number 85 which was simply test 1, test 2 and test 3 and so on. In addition, I have slightly increased this data set. I've added more records for each athlete and a few more different fitness variables so that we've got a slightly more comprehensive report that we can generate. If I just filter by name here, we can see that there's a reasonable number of tests for this athlete, nine, and for other athletes, even more, in some cases, a couple less. So just going to show all the data again go straight to the report page and get started. I've stripped away all the work that we've done previously and left only the drop down box for the athlete name and a simple lookup formula that extracts the athlete position based upon their name. Everything else is left for us to do. What we're trying to do is extract the row numbers for each record in the database that match, matches this athlete's name. And then we're trying to only use the largest five of those. So the largest number is the most recent if your database is sorted in date order. The second largest number is the second most recent data set and so on. So with five rows in this data set, we're extracting the current record and the previous four. There are two formulas we can use to extract these row numbers. I'm just going to do it on the right hand side here before we put it into our table. Both of these methods will give you the same numbers. One requires an array formula and the other one doesn't. Let's have a look at large first up. Our array needs to be all records that meet our criteria. I can use an if function to tell us that. If our criteria is met, i.e. if the athlete name equals the name that was selected here, then we need to create an array of row numbers. This will give us the actual row number, but we want the record number instead. And because there's seven rows with either headings or just descriptions above our data set, I need to subtract seven from that. Close that bracket. Excel also needs to know what number we want. Do we want the first largest, the second largest, third largest, or so on? I can just use our helper column here by clicking on the one. This is an array function. I need to hold down Control, Shift, and Enter at the same time. And you can see up in the formula bar there is curly brackets before the equals and after the last bracket. Double click, send it down, and you can see that we have nine records extracted. If we choose a different athlete, we can see that there are 10 records. To avoid those errors, I'm going to put if error at the beginning, empty quotes at the end, and I'm not going to forget to array into that with the control shift enter. On its own, that's not a big deal. Those array functions aren't going to be too thirsty, but that's primarily because our data set is quite small. There's only 100 rows. 
If we had thousands of rows and lots of these array functions, it might become a problem. But nevertheless, let's have a look at the second way. It's called aggregate. The concept is the same. If we scroll down, this is a big list of different options we've got inside the aggregate function. One of them is called large. As soon as we hit the comma, we go to the next parameter, and that is we want to ignore error values. We'll get an error value if the athlete name does not equal our selected athlete. And so that's why number six as the second option is required. And now this is a little bit of a hard to read formula because 14 and 6 doesn't mean too much unless you're familiar with this function. But stick with it because this formula is very useful in particular when you have multiple criteria. Our array is an array of row numbers based upon our criteria. First let's put the row in. That's what we're looking to extract. And in this case, we divide by our criteria. Which is where athlete name equals C3. If we had a second criteria, we would put it in here. We only have one for now, so I don't need to but I still have to put the K or the item number that we're looking for and then hit enter. Double click, send that down. As you can see we get exactly the same information as we did in column J with the large function. I'm going to scoop this out, paste it across here in our row number and just realign that cell there which says A6. Copy that down for five rows and then paste it down to our two other grids as well. Now if you've watched the other videos you'll realize that now our task is pretty straightforward. We just use the index function to extract out the variable that we're looking for. First up, it's label, and we've got our row number here. And we can copy that down. So we can see the most recent data on top, and then the four previous values underneath. If we drag that across, we'll find that we have to update the field name. And when we hit enter, we we'll also have to update the format a little bit. And similar all the way across. It's just a process of making sure we've got the format and the row numbers aligned correctly. Once we've got all five sorted out in the first row we can drag down. We can align however we like. I'm going to put it in the center and that top grid is now finished. We just have to repeat the process for the other parts of the table. I'm going to quickly do that. So I've quickly gone through now, use the index function, aligned it to the particular row number that we've got in column B and extracted out all the information. All three tables now are populating with new data each time you select your athlete name. And all of these formula are identical. They refer to the database, they have a different field name matching the one at the top of the grid, and they've got the same row number, the second, third, fourth or fifth most recent. Don't need this stuff out the side here, so I'm just going to drag it away, but leave it for your reference. Something I can now do is add a simple chart. And so I have added some very simple charts, not plotting all the data from each grid, just a selected variable or two. I've used some data labels 
and I've changed up the charts a little bit. You can obviously pick and choose what you like. The final thing that I would do would be to select the space. I don't want to print out columns A and B, so I'm not going to select them. On the page layout, I'm going to set the print area. In the view tab, I'm going to turn off the grid lines. And I'm going to see what it looks like. We've got it to fit on one page, and that doesn't look too bad. So if I click Save, and then go up here, try a different athlete, and see what it looks like. So we can see the data is now changing automatically based upon the five most recent data sets. It's not perfect. We could do a little bit more formatting of some of these charts, and possibly we could add the single leg jumps on uh, the right hand edge of the speed and power table and we could probably do a little bit better with the title up the top with a logo and so on so I'm going to do that on this file and you can ask me for it by email if you like and I'll send it right through I've got one more of these videos to go so stay tuned